This is the second part of a three-part series on almost banned from the Bible, featuring the book of Esther. Now, by the end of the series, I will, as I mentioned last week, uh, include a couple other references, possibly to the Song of Songs, as well as Ecclesiastes, which were also almost banned from the Bible. Uh, but today, what we're going to do is really focus on, on Esther. So, uh, almost banned from the Bible, introducing Esther, uh, session two. So, last week, we talked about the five basic elements of plot in virtually any story, or at least most stories. And I wanted to review those today and just give you a, a breakdown of the, of the structure. I want to reconstruct the plot so that we know exactly what's happening in the story and why, as I'll show you later this morning, it's important. We talk first about exposition. Exposition involves providing the background. Uh, it introduces the characters. It answers questions of who, that is again, the main characters, what, uh, that's typically the setting, what's going on as well with regard to the setting, when, uh, um, and in this case, it's during the reign of Xerxes. Xerxes one, incidentally, is uh, the Persian name for Ahasuerus or Asu Ahasuerus, there are two pronunciations, and he is the king of Persia. He is the grandson, as you know, of Cyrus the Great, who liberated the Jews in 537, 536 BCE. And he wages, according to the movie 300, as well as history, he wages a battle with, uh, with the Greeks and he loses. So he retreats from that battle, but he nevertheless, in uh, his post uh, uh, soldiering days, nevertheless uh, uh, rules over, according to the story at least, 127 or 28 provinces from India to Nubia, or what we would call today Ethiopia. Now scholars typically regard that as an exaggeration and that, that it reflects the genre itself. Recall that Xerxes holds a banquet at the beginning for 500 days. The, uh, the, the Hebrew word there can be translated drink fest. So we're, we're entering a world of exaggerations. Herodotus, the Greek historian, says that Xerxes ruled over a much more modest uh, 20 provinces rather than 128 provinces. So uh, we're, we're entering a, a different world here, and the exposition helps set that up. It's about the first two chapters of the story, and by the end of it, we've met the king, Ahasuerus. We've met, uh, uh, we've met Esther herself. We've met Mordecai, Esther's cousin and guardian. We've met uh, Haman, who is uh, appointed to as the king's highest official and uh, who gets in a quarrel with Mordecai that sets up what comes next, which is rising action. So rising action involves uh, a, a, an inciting incident, an inciting incident, uh, and then after that, uh, it escalates the, the, uh, uh, the conflict. So can you tell me, you recall what the inciting incident is in the story? It's the refusal of the, the king's queen, Vishta, Vashti, um, oh. to, um, to obey his commands about performing or appearing at a banquet and their, and his, um, therefore looking for another wife. Yeah, I would argue that's actually uh, part of the rising action itself, but the inciting incident occurs just after that. But you're right, that, that reflects at least the, this rising action. It, it's, it helps begin escalate conflict. The incident itself I'm thinking of occurs just after that. So if you take a look here, uh, we have, I'll come back to these in a second. Uh, Notice uh, what happens here in uh, chapter uh, three, one through six. So after these things, King Ahasuerus or Ahasuerus promoted Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. Now I highlighted Agagite because uh, this is really important. Uh, an Agagite is a descendant of the Canaanites. He's not Persian. So you already have some really interesting uh, um, tidbits in the story. And all of the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and did obeisance to Haman. 
But Mordecai did not bow down or do obeisance. And I highlight that because, as you can guess, that's the inciting incident. It sets up a conflict that is going to uh, that is going to create tension throughout the rest of the story until it's resolved uh, um, uh, at the end. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command when they spoke to him day after day and would not listen to them? They told him on for he had told them that he was a Jew. When, Mor when Haman saw that Mordecai did, did not bow down or do obeisance to him, Haman was infuriated. We have a wounded ego here. He was infuriated. And then again, notice the exaggeration, but he thought it beneath him to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So having been told who Mordecai's people were, Haman plotted to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. So what you have here is the inciting incident, which is the refusal to bow, the reason uh, Mordecai indicates that he's a Jew, and then finally the plot, which is uh, uh, the plot to kill all the Jews. Now, that's the exaggeration. This is the first instance we have in the Bible, at least, of, of a planned genocide. And you can see then why this text is going to take, uh, take on a particularly uh, troubling, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say meaning, but there's, uh, it's reading it after the Holocaust affects the way that we read it. Uh, so we have this attempted genocide, at least for the Jews of Persia, and that is going to drive the plot. Now let's go back for a second. Those transitions, by the way, wow. All right, um, those are fun. So uh, we have rising action. The climax of the story we talked about last week, and that's the moment where the uh, typically, the often the point where everything changes or the main character is forced to make a life-altering decision. And we have that, of course, in uh, Esther herself. Uh, you'll notice here, uh, that after Mordecai confronts her and says that her people will die and that she has to do something, she finally uh, uh, concedes and says, after that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So to appear before the king without summons is against the law. Uh, Esther risks her life uh, for the sake of her people, and this is really the climax of the story. Uh, which involves, as I said, a, a life-altering decision on the part of the main character, uh, Esther. The last thing I wanted to mention were uh, our uh, rising, I'm sorry, falling action and resolution. This is where we move toward resolution. The conflicts of the subplots are resolved. Uh, Hammond, for example, is executed in place of Mordecai on the, the very... Uh, um, Oh, what's that called? I just blanked. On the, the, the device for execution uh, that, uh, that stands 50 feet, 50 cubits tie, high, which is 75 feet tall, um, a gallows basically. So again, what you have is exaggeration. What kind of gallows stands 75 feet tall? So all the Jews of Persia, uh, a gallows that stands 75 feet tall or 50 cubits, 127 provinces, uh, drink, drink fests that last for, in one case, 500 days. All of this contributes to the genre of the text, which we'll discuss uh, um, not this session, but the next. Finally, the resolution, the, uh, the end of the story where we tie up loose ends. Now, what I want to do here is uh, stop and see if you have any questions. This is what we talked about last week, just the structure of the story so that you understand what we're going to do in today's session and especially in the next. Any questions or comments? All right, well then in the words of Han Solo, here's where the fun begins. This is the, uh, to me, the exciting part. What we're gonna talk about next is the, uh, let's see here, the, uh, Reception of Esther or signs of concern about Esther. So let's take a look. I am still working on, there we go. Wow, look at that. That one took uh, about uh, 20 minutes to figure out. Okay, signs of concern about Esther. Now, last week, you recall, I featured, uh, I featured uh, artistic work. We talked about it briefly. This is a, a portrait of rabbis arguing over the interpretation of scripture. 
I love it. Uh, if you're curious, I can send you the citations for these or any of the, the uh, um, commentaries that I cite. But I always think of that line, uh, two Jews, three opinions. And the reason this is important is that there was uh, uh, quite a bit of debate, apparently, over the book of Esther. And one of the, uh, the scholars that I used for the presentations talks about this as signs of concern, signs of concern. So this is really where the debate begins when it comes to Esther's reception history. And what I wanted to do was give you reasons for why uh, some early Christian, uh, I'm sorry, Jews and Christians both decided that Esther might not be worth including in the Bible. So let's talk about this one first. Whoops, let's go back here a second. The first reason uh, is that um, the rabbis debated it. There is a line in the Talmud, which is uh, an early interpretive text of the Hebrew Bible, that, uh, that talks about a debate where the scroll of Esther potentially defiles the hands of those who read it and was not authorized to be written down. The, uh, the argument is that, uh, that the book itself should have remained an oral history that the Jews uh, shared from generation to generation, presumably when they celebrate Purim, which is the uh, festival commemorating the reversal of Haman's ruthless plot to destroy all the Jews. There is uh, um, the idea here again is that the Esther story was meant to be recited verbally and not written down. Now, the Talmud does not give reasons for why, but we can speculate. And I think you'll see some of those reasons as follows. So that's the first, uh, the first issue is uh, the rabbis debating the book's inclusion in the Bible. And this debate flickers and crackles for several centuries. Um, and so uh, I think it's really interesting. The, uh, the Song of Songs was also debated, as I mentioned before. And that one's really interesting. The Song of Songs, as you know, it contains the only erotic love poetry in the Hebrew Bible. It's also the only text in the Hebrew Bible that celebrates what scholars call a non-coercive form of love between a man and a woman. And I think that's really important. And I think we're quite lucky in that regard that the, Psalm, uh, the Song of Songs was included. Uh, some scholars regard it as a celebration of what life should have been like in the Garden of Eden. And I think that's uh, quite beautiful. Uh, it elevates uh, non-coercive love in a way that, that I think uh, rightly contrasts with other books in the Hebrew Bible. The only reason, or one of the only reasons, I would say the Song of Songs was uh, finally made it in, two reasons. The first was that the rabbis and later the Christians allegorized the text. So the Song of Songs is literally about the love between a man and a woman, the romantic love. But what the rabbis began to argue is that the text is ultimately about the love between God and Israel which uh, again softens it, makes it less uh, offensive, whatever. And the Christians did the same. They allegorized it, although they argued that, of course, it's not between God and Israel, it's between Christ and the church, or as Origen of Alexandria argues, it's between Christ and the soul. Scholars today generally shy away from those allegorical interpretations, but that was arguably one of the things that saved the Song of Songs for the Hebrew Bible. The other thing is that the Song of Songs is attributed to Solomon. Uh, they say that Sol King Solomon wrote the Song of Songs in his youth. He wrote the Proverbs uh, when he reached uh, a maturity, and then he wrote Ecclesiastes when he was bitter uh, in his older years. <laughs> I think that's a, a rather uh, bizarre, not bizarre, but there's no evidence really to suggest that, that this is the case, but that was tradition. And because of that tradition, some argue the Song of Songs was included, namely, uh, the belief that it was written like Proverbs, like Ecclesiastes by King Solomon himself. All right, so signs of concern about Esther. Any questions so far? Okay, let's keep going. Uh, the next um, reason or sign of concern comes to us from the Christian faith. Uh, the early... Um, uh, Christians, uh, there are, we have what are called um, uh, uh, lists of the canon. And so what I want to do is I want to uh, just explain a little bit of that to you. 
So a canon is uh, an established set of texts uh, that is sort of like the, the, uh, the Jews or the Christians' uh, greatest hits. And determining, uh, as you can imagine, which of those books would ultimately be among the greatest hits or the early playlists of, of the Jews and Christians or going back uh, a mixtape where you put the best, uh, your favorite songs on a tape or a CD, um, these can be rather contentious. It, uh, uh, and they can take a long time. The, the Christian canon, that is the New Testament as we have it now, wasn't formed until at the earliest 367 of the Common Era. We have a list from St. Athanasius in the Eastern Church of, for the first time of all 27 books of the New Testament. So as the canon is being formed, there is lots of debate about what should be included and what should be left out of the various texts that are available. Uh, for example, because its author authorship was disputed, the book of Revelation almost didn't make it into the Bible. Uh, when it comes to the, the Hebrew Bible, again, the Song of Songs, because of its authorship, it did make, or perceived authorship, it did make it into the Bible. Now, the, the uh, Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible, from a Jewish perspective, as we have it now, wasn't wasn't finalized until between 90 and 100 of the first century. So it took the Jews a long time. The process was occasioned by the destruction of their first temple. They realized that they could no longer be a people who, uh, whose worship and faith centered on the temple itself. And so what they had to do was gather the books, the scrolls that were most important to them uh, for the sake of preserving their faith tradition. And that's what they did. The, uh, the Christian faith uh, did something of the same, not for the sake of saving their tradition, but for the sake, well, yeah, actually for the sake of that, uh, for posterity at least. And that, uh, that wasn't finished, as I said, until the fourth century. Now, here's why I tell you all of this. In some early Christian canon lists, the book of Esther is excluded. And that's very telling. That's really important. So there are a number of books that are excluded. I already mentioned uh, the book of Revelation. First and second Timothy didn't appear on a canon list until the end of the, uh, the second century. The Gospels were probably included by around uh, 160, 165. A man named Justin Martyr is the first to, uh, to name all four as central to the Christian faith. And then before that, of course, we have Paul's letters, which probably achieved authoritative status by the end of the first century. And there is a tradition, I, I did this in a sermon once, that Onesimus, who is named in Philemon, he's the, the, uh, the, sleeve that, uh, <laughs> the slave that, uh, that uh, Paul requests freedom for. Uh, Onesimus is mentioned later in the first century as an important leader of the church. And one theory is that Onesimus, in gratitude to what Paul did for him by freeing him, uh, Onesimus gathered Paul's letters, and it's because of him that we have Paul's letters in our Bible now, which I think is so fascinating. It's a, it's a really neat theory. So the, the rabbis debated it. The, uh, the early Christians uh, also ex excluded, in some cases, the book, and I'll tell you why even more as we go. Uh, the third reason... Uh, that scholars will uh, know there was some dispute around this book is that it, uh, let me just go back to the slide here for a second. The reason I have this up is that, again, out of all 27 books in the New Testament canon, which is over 8,000 words, there's not a single reference to Esther. That, in addition to the canon lists, is indicative of, of uh, what its debatable status would have been in the first century. We also know after the first century that it wasn't cited by a single Christian commentary until the seventh century. So again, we're talking about a text that was in dispute and we have evidence for that both in the old and, uh, I'm sorry, in the, the Hebrew and Christian traditions. So those are the first three. Are there any questions at this point? Okay, no questions? All right, then we move next. Oh, not next to him. We move next to uh, uh, the, the Greek. So uh, you probably know that the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek. It's, uh, it's the translation that the New Testament authors used. 
It was uh, accomplished probably in about the third century before Christ in Egypt, where there were Greek speaking Jews. I'm sorry, yeah, Jews speaking Greek in Egypt. Now, can you guess why they were speaking Greek in Egypt? Any guesses? Alexander the Great. That's precisely, that's, that's exactly it, Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great had conquered that, that area, and because of that, the language became Greek. Uh, there were Jews, part of the diaspora, which means the dispersion, that, uh, that began possibly all the way uh, back to the first, uh, the first of two victories over the Jews in about 722, this case by the Assyrians, and the, uh, the, the destruction and scattering of the, of the 10 tribes of the north of the Jews. And uh, these are called the lost tribes of Israel. Um, it's believed that, that some of these went to, for example, Ethiopia, which of course, as you know, is also where they harbor the Ark of the Covenant, but I'll leave that to movies. Um, but it's these, uh, these Jews who are forced to leave their homeland that are in this case living in Egypt. Uh, the, the lingua franca is Greek, and so because of that, a Greek translation uh, is made, and that translation includes additional books, as well as, and here's uh, um, another instance of why Esther might have been disputed, as well as an expansion of the Esther story in Greek. So I believe four chapters are added, as well as uh, several prayers that Mordecai and Esther offer that don't appear in the original story. There's something else that doesn't appear in the original story too, and it is added as well. So you have expansions. And the, the idea here seems to be that the original version, according to some, was deficient. It was deficient. And so we see this occasionally in other biblical books. Uh, conclusions are added, uh, texts are added, and so forth. In this case, uh, four chapters are added, and they include, as I said, prayers that Esther and Mordecai offer. Now, this um, book is still in the uh, the Roman Catholic uh, book, uh, I'm sorry, Bible, but in uh, because they include what's called the Apocrypha, the additional writings that are not part of the Hebrew canon. Um, however, uh, they were um, they are not this. It's not included in our Bible, in the Protestant Bible, and the reason is that. The Protestant Bible, going back to Luther himself, used the Hebrew text for its translation, not the Jewish um, text. Now, this uh, next slide is very important because it shows um, what reputation Esther has garnered by the uh, Pro Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther writes, I am so great an enemy to Esther that I wish it had not come to us at all, for it has too many heathen unnaturalities. Now, what on earth do you think heathen unnaturalities might be? I mean, for me, this is why I want to read the book. <laughs> uh, but uh, but for Luther, this is uh, this is a bad thing. Now, another uh, translation calls it, I, this is my favorite one, uh, says that Esther, according to Luther, contains uh, too much pagan naughtiness. Too much pagan naughtiness. Now, again, that's why I want to read the book. What's going on in here? Um, so uh, the reason may be for Luther in this regard that um, uh, the story of how Esther became queen itself violates the Christian concept of marriage. Um, so if you look at um, uh, if you look at the uh, the text, which we're going to do in a second, uh, one of them uh, will show that that Esther uh, was part of a harem, and I think that's part of the reason for why Luther had so much trouble with this is that it it, it didn't accord with Christian um, moral sensibilities uh, up to and 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 through Luther's time. Uh, so you have uh, Luther. And then Luther's disdain persists until the 20th century. And I just wanted to share with you this one. By the time we get to uh, the, the middle of the 20th century, biblical scholars are still expressing uh, disdain for Esther on moral grounds. Uh, for example, 
L. E. Brown of Peake's Commentary on the Bible, which was published in 1962, says the only useful place Esther has in scripture uh, is to offer, and this is a quote, a picture of unredeemed humanity. A picture of unredeemed humanity. So that's the only reason this author argues it, uh, it has any merit in scripture of all. It simply shows us how bad people can be. Now, when I hear things like this, my immediate uh, response is, well, what's the rest of the story? Why would, why would scholars be so uncharitable when it comes to uh, the, the story itself? And so that's why I have this next slide up. What's all the fuss about? Why were uh, Jews and Christians from uh, even before the first century all the way up to the 20th so disdainful with regard to this book? What's all the fuss about? Now, uh, in getting to an answer, what I would like to hear from you are reasons for why. So let's open this up for a bit. See if you can uh, answer for me, what do you think made Esther a source of debate and disdain? Yeah, Nancy. Um, I guess initial response would be puritanical values and lust that was shown in to be obviously there in the king's choice. Yeah, and I think actually uh, that that, uh, that may also be another reason for why the Song of Songs, well, it is another reason for why the Song of Songs was, uh, was the subject of debate and why they allegorized it to save it. There seems to be a, uh, a general discomfort, especially in the Christian tradition around issues like lust uh, and so forth. And we can probably thank St. Augustine for that. Uh, Augustine, in many ways, uh, turned um, sexual relations into a, um, a major moral issue and, uh, and helped inspire a puranical attitude toward it subsequently. So I think you're absolutely right, Nancy, that, that one of the reasons would have been that, it, there, that it's a story that involves not only court intrigue uh, and, and uh, action adventure, uh, but also lust. Yeah. I think it would have made a great Netflix special myself, but... Yes, but it, but it also makes for terrible uh, YouTube videos. <laughs> uh, so uh, so I, I was actually going to include a couple excerpts from, from, uh, from Esther's stories, and I thought, I cannot do this to my congregation. They're pretty brutal. Um, but if you type in Queen Esther on, uh, on YouTube, there are some, some uh, rather poor quality movies. There was a movie done, I think, with Joan Crawford, I want to say, uh, or Ooh. Collins. Is that all right? Maybe Joel can help me with that. Uh, it was, yeah, uh, so it was done. I, um, anyway, that's on YouTube, I believe. And um, yeah, and I watched a video called uh, Things You Probably Didn't Know About Esther, and I was going to use that too. But it attributes a lot of claims to scholarship that, that are really disreputable. And so I decided not to include that. So if you do type in Queen Esther, please just take the claims that are made about the story with a grain of salt. Anytime you hear somebody citing random websites, uh, at least it makes me a little nervous. Um, so yes, there was, uh, there have been a few uh, movies. Uh, let's hope that if there ever is one on Netflix that it's actually good. Yeah. Um, others, other reasons for why Esther might've been. Yeah, go ahead, Rich. Not much mention of God. Yeah. doing anything or people yeah i was wondering if somebody listening yeah yeah that's perfect that's exactly where we're going to go next so let's save that but that's that's the big issue is uh is uh it, it doesn't it's it's not even that there's not much mention there is no mention of esther in this of, of god in the story of esther so that's going to be a major source of controversy, and it's one of the reasons why Luther in particular had such disdain for the story. It doesn't even, at least in its Hebrew version, mention God. Now you go to the Greek version, and the Greek version, as I said, which expands the story by four chapters, includes not only prayers to God from Esther and Mordecai, but also abundant references to God uh, in the story. And the first time I read Esther, 
uh, at least somewhat recently. I read it probably years ago in seminary. But the first time I read it somewhat recently, I was reading my grandfather's Catholic Bible. And uh, there are all these references to God. And so then I go to the, the scholarship and I'm thinking, well, what's this all about? And I discover that that was the, the Greek version, not the Hebrew version. So, yeah. So no reference to God. Lots of lust. What else? What other reasons can you uh, can you surmise when it comes to why Esther was almost banned from the Bible based on what I've shared so far? Um, the. I can imagine that the fact that the protagonist is um, is a woman and not a guy was probably yeah. not didn't sit too well with the people who are putting together the yeah uh, I that's exactly right you are all just doing great here so the uh, uh, this is something that uh, feminist uh, biblical scholarship has pointed out in the last few decades and rightly so uh, Mordecai historically is considered the quote unquote real hero of the story even though it's clearly Esther who saves her people. Uh, so the fact that the, that the focus has shifted to Mordecai, it's also uh, called, uh, I believe it's called Mordecai's Day when, uh, when they celebrate it uh, uh, two days a year, uh, um, when they celebrate the, uh, the reversal that happens. Uh, it's called Mordecai's Day. So the fact that the holiday is named after Mordecai, the fact that, um, that uh, Mordecai is considered the real hero of the story, and also the fact, and we saw this last week uh, in, um, in Western art, um, in the, at the end of the story, it says that Esther and Mordecai wrote it, but in subsequent Western art, there are pictures where um, Mordecai is doing the writing and Esther is standing back, uh, you know, pious and proper. So, uh, so we have a number of um, subsequent interpretations that really deviate from what we have in the text. And that probably, in fact, it does reflect uh, the, the uh, dominant patriarchal tradition in Christianity and with it, the, uh, the suspicion regarding a female protagonist. Absolutely. So, so yeah, so the fact that Esther was given such uh, high acclaim in the story the fact that uh, it contains this pagan naughtiness, according to Luther, the fact that it never mentions God, uh, and there's something else here as well. Toward the end of the story, um, the Jews uh, cut down their adversaries. They take revenge on anyone they believe would have uh, uh, killed them during, this, during the day that Haman sets aside, and it's quite ruthless. So it was also the violence of the text, uh, and that was an, another reason why the book of Revelation in the New Testament almost didn't make it into the Bible. The, 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 the abundance of violence in the text made some Christians and Jews rather reluctant to include it, and I think that's a much more noble reason. It's probably the only valid reason among, uh, among the ones we've named so far. Uh, Martin Luther also felt that the story painted Gentiles in an extremely negative light. Uh, this is even uh, worse in the Greek editions. And so because of the way it pictured non-Jews, Luther was also dismissive, which again is a problem given what Luther says later in his life about the Jews. So you have a, a, a number of issues here that help us understand why Esther was almost banned in the Bible. And what I wanna do now is take you through a few of them uh, by way of a uh, slide. So let's talk first about... Can, can, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Uh, so the Greek, the Greek translation of, of, this, of this book confuses me because I, where did they get these four chapters from? Like, how do they know that these are things that belong to the story? Did they just make them up and, and just- They added them. Okay. Yep. they added them. Now, in okay. some cases, things are added because of oral tradition. I don't, I'm not aware of any oral tradition here. The, uh, uh, it just depends. I mean, uh, when the story was written, there are some scholars that, that, that date Esther, the, the, when the story was written, uh, right after the events transpired. And we know from- uh, from archaeological history and so forth, that Xerxes ruled from, I think it was 485 to 465, something like that, uh, a few generations after the Jews had been liberated from the Babylonians. Uh, so you have another century or so before this text emerges, the Greek text. And yeah, they, uh, 
they simply added these uh, these chapters. And that's the reason for why Luther didn't include this version in the Protestant Bible. He wanted to go with the Hebrew uh, text, not the Greek. Uh, we not only have additions to this story in the Greek translation, we also have uh, additional documents. That's why the Catholic Bible is is uh, um, has more in it than the than the Protestant Bible. They were at the time using the Greek translation. Um, Luther and Calvin rejected the the uh, um, these additional texts insofar as they were considered canonical by Christians, but they didn't say they were altogether bad. So there is occasion where Luther and Calvin will quote these texts. They just don't have the same authority as the canonized version that we have in the Protestant Bible. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So let's, that's a great question. So let's talk about uh, um, reasons uh, for why Esther was almost banned in the Bible. And uh, several of these will repeat what you said, which is great. So the first reason, I, again, is slaughter, um, violence. Uh, this is from Esther 9.5. So the Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, slaughtering and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. Uh, pretty bad. Uh, the, the story indicates that the slaughter occurred uh, in the capital, for example, of Susa, where they struck down 500 people. Elsewhere, uh, you have tens of thousands of people. So it's a, it's a widespread uh, campaign of, of destruction, and it's authorized by the king um, uh, on the, uh, uh, in response to Esther's request to obtain revenge on the enemies of the Jewish people. There are several references indicating that the Jews stopped short of plundering, but men, women, and children were, uh, were struck down by the Jews uh, in, for the sake of getting revenge on the people who would have killed them. Question or comment? Could I just add something? I'm sorry, this Please. is Jack. I, I find it fascinating that we're talking about Christians who were at this time um, very, very negative about Jews um, having problems with the text about how the Jews are um, doing what they please to those who hate them. I think that's such a great point, Jackie, especially uh, when it comes to Martin Luther. Uh, if you look within the Jewish tradition itself, by about the, the Middle Ages, by about 12 or 1300 of the Common Era, you have a kind of reversal that occurs in the Jewish faith, which I love, and, and so I'm so glad you brought this up. There is a, uh, a, a Jewish philosopher, possibly the greatest philosopher of the Jewish philosopher of the Middle Ages called Moses Maimonides. Some of you have probably heard uh, of Maimonides. He's one of my favorite uh, uh, writers in the tradition. My friend Bri Beatrice has very little regard for him, but I like him because he's a theologian. He's also an accomplished Torah scholar, uh, was also a physician, was also uh, had expertise in astronomy, a real Renaissance man before the Renaissance. And what Maimonides says, for reasons I'll go into next session, is that Esther not only um, uh, should be included in the, in the Hebrew canon, but only Esther and the, the Torah, the first five books of the canon, will survive the transition from this age to the Messianic age. And the reason for that, uh, Maimonides says, is that Esther provides the only commandment of its kind in the entire Hebrew Bible consistent with the mood of joy that is to come in the Messianic age. And that is, the Jews are commanded to celebrate. They're commanded to celebrate. And the festival of Purim is a two-day celebration of how they reversed uh, a plot to, uh, to destroy them all. So Maimonides felt that this alone, it's Esther 9.28, that this alone, this unique commandment, uh, justified the, uh, uh, the, uh, the book of Esther as one that would uh, be relevant and survive into the next age. Here's what uh, Maimonides also said. The rest of the Hebrew canon, all the prophets, as well as the other writings, will be nullified by God. They will be obliterated by God. And the reason for this is that many of those books preserve memories of suffering. And so because of that reason, because the Messianic age is one of joy and celebration, 
uh, an age where persecution of the Jews has ended, Maimonides felt that Esther was not only queen of Persia, but should be queen of the canon. And I love it. And there's more to come about Maimonides. He ends up being one of the, the real heroes, I would say, of the interpretive tradition because of the fact that he's one of the first to help really rehabilitate uh, the book of Esther. Um, so as for the, uh, the hypocrisy of, of other Christians, yeah, it is a problem. I tend to give Christians of the first few centuries a break because they were, at least until they became the state religion of the Roman Empire, they were pacifists. Uh, they seem to be a little more consistent uh, in that regard with the teachings of Jesus. But even by the end of the first century, you, you already have anti-Judaizing sentiment. So uh, your point is well taken, Jackie, and, and I appreciate you mentioning that. All right. Uh, so this was the first reason uh, that, uh, that um, Christians, but also, and I think Jackie, this is important too, some Jews were quite, uh, quite um, nervous about this text for this reason. Um, so uh, I like to think of it this way. This is the moment where, uh, Joel, you'll have to help me out. Is it in Joel where the, uh, the, uh, the swords are turned into plowshares? Does that sound right? Or is it plowshares turned into swords? Plowshares turned into swords. Yeah, so, uh, so the plowshares turned into swords also applies here. It's a reversal, I think, of Isaiah, if I have that right. But either way, uh, um, this is a reversal of that sentiment. The Jews turn their plowshares into swords, and they use their swords to cut down their adversaries. All right, that's the first reason. Uh, the second reason that people were nervous is, uh, is the festival of Purim. So, and this one's really fascinating. Uh, let me just shrink this for a second. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed and when many young women were gathered in the, the citadel, whoops, wait a second. Uh, this is actually the third reason. So let me, uh, let me go back to, uh, to Purim for a second. Um, how many of you are familiar with the, uh, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947? I'm sure most of you are. So this is the story. If somebody want to explain that, actually, what, what's discovered there? Scrolls belonging to whom, I, I guess I should ask. Bits, oh, oh, I don't remember who. There are okay. bits, bits of stuff in a cave in jars. Yeah, yeah. So these are uh, these these jars preserve scrolls that belonged that were found in a cave by a shepherd. Uh, actually, several uh, caves kind of sprinkled along the northern coast of the, I want to say of the the Dead Sea. Um, but uh, these scrolls were discovered, and uh, and what they noticed, and this is so interesting, is that none of the scrolls preserve the Book of Esther. Esther was the book excluded. And uh, the scrolls were, were originally stored there by a group of semi-monastic Jews called the Essenes, who lived uh, uh, well outside Jerusalem. And the, the, uh, the thinking there is that the Essenes ex excluded the Esther scroll, not only for the reason that Rich gave, which is that God is never mentioned, but also because of the festival of Purim. The festival of Purim today is called a festival where anything goes where the Jews are freed to live out. Uh, I mean, there's some talk that, that even, uh, they don't even have to celebrate kosher uh, or observe kosher during the festival. That's also one of the reasons why there was some question about Esther is that she doesn't seem to be a practicing Jew, but simply a Jew by ethnicity. Um, but uh, the, the uh, story of Esther was excluded. And what scholars believe that is that the Essenes themselves were rather uncomfortable with the holiday of Purim which is, uh, again, the holiday that celebrates the overcoming of Hammond's plot. And uh, yeah, please, Carol Ann. Uh, is it possible, since they were discovered by monastic Jews, that this book was just considered a little too naughty for men who shouldn't be interested in women? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I, that, it's very possible. And it's possible that because the naughtiness itself might have been up uh, lifted up during the festival that they didn't include it. Um, to me, this is sort of like, um, 
Scandinavian Lutheranism and its refusal to clap during a worship service. <laughs> there, there seems to be some real hesitation here based on sensibilities that, that, were, that have been cultivated uh, in terms of their setting and context. So it's, uh, it's very possible that it, they excluded it, not only for theological reasons, but because, as you're saying, Caroline, they were uncomfortable with, uh, with some of the things that it had to say uh, uh, in terms of the, the behavior. So, uh, so the Essenes uh, excluded it uh, as well from, from their list of scrolls. Now, the third I wanted to talk about was the, uh, the issue of sexual immorality. And this is what I, uh, the text I had in mind a bit earlier when we were talking about uh, Luther. Uh, it's chapter two, verses eight through nine. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in the citadel of Susa in custody of Haggai, who was uh, one of the king's eunuchs, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai. So right away, this uh, we, we can already see the situation. Notice the language of custody. Uh, um, young women were summoned to the king. Uh, and 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 uh, Mordecai encouraged Esther. So she really has a very small degree of agency up until chapter four when she makes the life-altering decision to risk her life for the sake of her people. Um, so Haggai, who had charge of the women, the girls pleased him, that is the king, and won his favor. And he quickly provided her, Esther, with her cosmetic treatments and her portion of food and with seven chosen maids from the king's palace and advanced her and her maids to the best place in the harem. So as you can see here, uh, we're not talking about sexual relations in the context of Christian marriage. We're talking about uh, a number of women who sexually please the king, presumably, and who are uh, included in his harem. And there are some, like Luther, who had a big problem with this uh, as a book in the Bible. Now, again, I want to join Jackie on this one. There's some hypocrisy here. Luther also uh, justified the, uh, the, the practice of bigamy when it came to one of the kings of, uh, of a German territory uh, named Philip of Hesse, uh, who uh, wanted multiple lives, wives <laughs> and lives, multiple wives. And so it seems convenient that for political purposes, Luther can endorse a practice outside the confines of what's accepted in the Christian faith, and yet at the same time turn around and dismiss this book in part because of its so-called pagan naughtiness. Um, so we've got a, an issue there. Uh, the next, uh, the next um, reason for why it's excluded is exactly, it's, this is great because you all anticipated all these, uh, is the point that Lisa made. And I want to come to that next. This is fascinating. Um, so Sidney uh, White Crawford, who's one of the leading uh, um, Esther scholars uh, in the uh, women's Bible commentary, says the following when it comes to the reception of Esther by people like Martin Luther. The story's elevation of a non-observant Jewish woman to the position of heroine has, quote, continued to baffle commentators, particularly white male Protestant commentators who wish to make the book conform to the expectations of a Western Christian audience. And what Crawford White and others point out is that we actually have good reason to believe not only that this book has been unfairly uh, um, judged by white male Protestant commentators uh, based on their, their sensibilities and their audience, but that it was also, as I suggested last week, um, possibly written by women. Um, there's a reference to Esther being involved in the writing uh, in chapter nine, there is also, uh, it's also the case, as Jackie pointed out earlier, that, that Queen Vashti uh, stands up for herself and uh, refuses to be objectified by the king. And uh, then, of course, there's also how the, um, uh, the king acts. He sends out an order telling all Persian men that their wives must obey their, that their wives must obey them. And it's ridiculous. Um, and so there's reason to believe that, that, the, that the king here is being mocked by the author because he's ridiculous. Uh, there's reason to believe that women wrote the story. Uh, and of course, the way Vashti and Esther are portrayed also reflect the possibility that women wrote the story. And I'm a big fan of that view. I also am a big fan of the view that the second part of Isaiah um, was written by a woman. Uh, it's possible that, uh, that the letter to the Hebrews was written by a woman. And all of this is coming out, guess what? 
when women start to have a role in the interpretation of scripture. Go figure. <laughs> Um, so, uh, my confirmation students and I are talking about this next week, and I think it's, uh, it's really important to bring up. All right. Any questions at this point? We're just about done here. Okay. The last and final reason for why Esther has so often been, uh, the object of disdain or was, uh, possibly almost excluded from the Bible is God. So God is never mentioned in this text, as, as Rich pointed out. Um, so the question is, uh, because the text never mentions God, is this then necessarily a secular story? And the answer is possibly. There are uh, basically three positions that scholars have taken on this story when it comes to its, uh, its uh, theology. Uh, the first is that uh, one passage in particular is clearly a reference to God, the only of its kind in the book. The second is that, uh, um, well, the first is that there's no reference to God. The second is there's one text in particular that is uh, worthy of our attention. The third is that there are many clues that are hidden by the author in the text, and that if we decode them, we will discover that this is a profoundly theological narrative about how God has liberated God's people through the actions of Esther. And that's where we're going next week to what I call the, uh, the, the secret interpretation of Esther that basically unlocks this puzzle and shows how if you decode it properly, there are all kinds of clues the narrator is giving to God who is involved in a, in a hidden way uh, on the margins, uh, in the wings, working to bring about the redemption of uh, Esther and the liberation of her people. So next week, we turn from reconstructing the story uh, and from the reasons for why it was excluded from the canon or almost excluded and uh, held in low regard to a rehabilitation of Esther by decoding it theologically. Wow, I think I talked way too much on this one. So are there any questions? I, I apologize if that's the case. Um, but we will be spending a lot more time in conversation next week as we get to these secrets uh, in our attempt to decode the book. So are there any questions or bigger, um, bigger questions in particular at this point? Yeah, I would just comment that to me, this is a very human story and probably very reflective of the times that people were living in. Um, and it strikes me as real for that time. Um, and of course we look at it through our, you know, our eyes of today uh, we can't help that, but um, I think it's quite remarkable. Hmm. The turn of events, the, you know, um, and I also, I know this has been sort of stated, maybe this is a little different statement about it, but the fact that a woman saved the Jewish people, all the men, I think uh, was quite dramatic. Um even though it was really the king that saved them. It was his decision. Um, yeah, but if it wasn't for Esther at Mordecai's uh, request, none of this would have happened, right? But you're right. It's ultimately the king who has to make the pronouncement. Really I think the man, the man yeah, made the decision, but yet she, the fact she had such an influence on him, that's why uh, I said last week, I thought it was a love story because I, I thought a long time, why would he do this? Why well, I think he was clearly enamored by her. There is a, a tradition that, that indicates that Esther's beauty was given to her by God to persuade the king and that she was so beautiful that the, um, that the king couldn't even look at her. Um, so uh, it was certainly, uh, there's certainly, uh, the, it's certainly the case that he was enamored by her physical beauty. Um, and, uh, and I mean, I don't know if I could say much more than that, uh, what you're suggesting is a possibility. It's not the, it's not an overriding theme in the story, but it, uh, there's, there are hints maybe, uh, particularly when she appears before him, uh, um, in chapter four, um, your point about context. I think that's a great observation there. Uh, there's a, a comment in the, uh, fortress old Testament commentary that says that the author is basically trying to recreate 
the, uh, the mood of the audience in the story itself. And what is that mood? The mood is that in the diaspora, uh, that is the dispersion in, uh, of the Jews in Persia, men and women who have been estranged from their homeland, they have to fend for themselves. They have to rely on their, on their own abilities, on their own resources, on their own ingenuity to save themselves. And that's a big part of the secular interpretation, that this is a story, uh, if you will, about um, self-reliance and how God helps those who help themselves. Now, uh, one commentator says that, and I think that's a, a particularly American spin on, uh, on this story. I would say, as a, a semi-good Lutheran, that, uh, that God helps those who help others. Um, that because Esther sacrifices, uh, um, almost sacrifices her own life, she says, if I perish, I perish. Because she, she, um, she does, makes this move, which I think is her conversion, uh, for the sake of her people, uh, there is, uh, you might say, a nudge from the divine. Um, or that the conversion itself is the work of the divine. And we'll be talking about that next week. So... Great points that you made. One or one, one more before we close. Yeah, Carol Ann. Go. I'll oh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Was there some special significance to the fact that when the Jews killed all of the non-Jews, they did not plunder? My thought was, if nobody's around to use that stuff you know use the leftover furniture and the bread and the wheat and uh that's a great question and i don't have the answer for it but i i can certainly find the answer for it i think it would be interesting to go into the commentaries and look specifically at that verse and see does anybody have any guesses as to why they they didn't plunder my, my guess was that it was reinstating that they were doing a good thing, that they weren't doing it for themselves. Yeah. For the higher purpose. But. That could be it. Yeah, that it's really uh, for the sake of their survival and not, not because of greed or, or anything like that. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Susan? Yeah, would it have anything to do with the Ten Commandments and, and not coveting? Oh, yeah, not stealing. Yeah, I think either of those. Yeah, that's interesting. Of course, the Ten Commandments also say thou shalt not kill, but that that uh, that commandment has been interpret, interpreted variously throughout the ages. Um, but yeah, it could have something to do with the, with the law, that the law itself prohibits, the Jewish law prohibits plundering for that reason. Now, that's a great guess. Any others? All right, so next week is the one I'm kind of hoping that we build uh, as we go, like, like the elements of a plot. So next week is where we really get to the decoding of this text and wait till you see what I've got. There are tons of surprises here and I can't wait to share them with you.